this lesson, I am going to cover joint replacements. We can have joints replaced for a number of reasons. Maybe the joint was shattered from a fall. Maybe the joint was too diseased from osteoarthritis and our patient had poor quality of life due to the decreased mobility. Maybe lupus or sickle cell disease ruined the joints from their disease process, which led to the hip to become necrotic. While the reasons are numerous, the way we care for the bone and the new prosthesis remain the same. Let's dive into this material to understand the nurse's responsibilities regarding joint replacements. The term arthroplasty refers to the surgical removal of a diseased joint due to osteoarthritis, osteonecrosis, rheumatoid arthritis, trauma, or congenital anomalies and replacing it with a prosthetic or artificial components made of metal and or plastic. Total joint arthroplasty, which can also be called total joint replacement, <clears throat> involves replacement of all components of an articulating joint. Most musculoskeletal surgery procedures are performed to repair usually the hips and the knees. However, we can do shoulders and other smaller joints as well. The two that we are going to particularly discuss in detail are the knee arthroplasty and the hip arthroplasty procedures. Okay, let's first talk about a total hip arthroplasty, or sometimes we just say total hips. This involves the replacement of the acetabular cup, the femoral head, and the femoral stem. If I can get my little pin, this one right here is the total hip replacement. As you can see, more has been exchanged and replaced with the prosthetic parts. Now, if a patient doesn't have long to live or maybe they are a little bit more immobile, we're gonna do the less invasive procedure. It's less traumatic on the body. There's a little bit of a quicker recovery. However, the hemis don't seem to last as long, but we are gonna do this procedure on a person, a hemiarthroplasty. It's a more conservative approach to fixing a broken hip, but it is well tolerated <clears throat> for our very frail and elderly patients. Looking at the knee, we can actually replace the full knee component. That refers to the distal femoral component, the tibia plate, and the patellar button. Longer recovery with a total knee arthroplasty. However, it's gonna have very good long-lasting results. If only a portion of it is diseased, then we can do what we call a uni, <laughs> or a unicondylar knee replacement. As you can see, only half of it is done. So if you had to take a guess, who has a quicker recovery, a total or a hemi? That's right, a hemi. Who has a quicker recovery, a total knee or a uni? Exactly, a uni. These patients can have more weight bearing than our uh, total replacements. And same for this one. This one will probably have weight bearing as tolerated. Well, this may, may be like 25% or toe touch weight bearing. We'll get there. Just want to give you a little preview of what's to come. Now it's a general consensus that if a patient has a major life-threatening injury to their hips or to their knees, then we're going to take them into surgery to save their life. However, if they need the arthroplasty due to maybe uh, lupus, maybe they've had long-standing osteoarthritis, then we must make sure that there are no relative contraindications to the procedure. Some reasons to reschedule the procedure are if the patient has a re recent or active infection. An example would be a UTI. So we oftentimes in pre-op are grabbing uh, a urine sample to make sure that they don't have a UTI. Maybe the patient has extremely poor blood flow to the affected extremity. We need blood flow for good healing. Another contraindication would be if a person is non-compliant. They are not able to comply with weight-bearing needs. Um, they have maybe 
little to no understanding about medication, maybe there's a history of substance abuse, they need to be able to follow the instructions. And this is something that the doctor usually might pick up on during the pre-assessment uh, and pre-surgical interview for this patient. They may also have, they meaning the patient candidate, may have comorbid conditions. One example would be uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension. That's your first one here. Uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension. The next one would be osteoporosis. That's right. If somebody has such severe osteoporosis, we can't electively go and set a prosthetic in there. The reason being is that the prosthetic would just fall right out and it would fail. It's not worth it. And a third reason would be a progressive inflammatory condition. One that it's in a uh, acute inflammatory state, kind of like they're having a, uh, an exacerbation at the moment. The last reason would be unstable cardiac or respiratory conditions. Gotta do a star for that one too. So it looks like our patient has expressed that they want to go through the surgery, uh, the total hip replacement or the total knee replacement, and they don't have any of the contraindications. So to proceed forward, it's a nurse's responsibility to make sure our lab work is in order, as well as the client is surgically ready and mentally and physically ready. <clears throat> or mentally ready in addition to physically ready. So what are we going to do? We're going to grab a CBC and we're going to make sure that the patient is not anemic because this can be a bloody procedure. We're going to assess their white blood cells looking for infection. We're going to check out their, C, uh, their BUN and creatinine just to make sure there is no organ failure going on in the background. We oftentimes will do a chest X-ray to rule out any kind of pulmonary surgical contraindications such as pneumonia or maybe a tumor that nobody is uh, aware of. We're going to grab an ECG or EKG, same thing. This is going to give us a baseline rhythm and identify any cardiovascular contraindications. We're going to do an X-ray of the hip. We're going to do multiple um, x-rays actually and they usually have those available for the physician to read just prior to starting. We're going to do an MRI and a CT of the affected joint just to see how extensive the damage is. Those are usually done a few weeks in advance. Now you see this medication it's called Epoetin Alpha. If we do notice that a CBC is drawn, usually way early in the process of this conversation, we are going to administer to a patient who is identified as having anemia, this drug called epoetin alpha. This is a hormone that the kidney typically produces and it goes to the bone marrow and it stimulates the production of red blood cells. So, if somebody is anemic before, beforehand, they give them a few doses of this, and then by the time they get to the surgery date, their red blood cells are ready to go. There is extensive uh, education that has to happen for the client that's going to have a joint replacement. During the pre-op period, if we feel that the patient is a risk for bleeding, as evidenced by advanced disease, then the doctor may recommend the patient do an autologous blood donation. This means months prior to their surgery, they're gonna to go to a blood bank, donate blood, but then it's gonna be sent to the hospital and kept uh, just in the event that the patient may need a blood transfusion. There needs to be a good chlorhexidine scrub down the night before and the morning of surgery. This is a product that can be given from the doctor to the patient or it can be picked up over the counter. We're going to ask that the patient wear clean clothes to bed and sleep on clean linens the night before surgery. This is actually shown to decrease the infection and complication, um, the complication rates following a joint replacement. <clears throat> We're going to ask that the person be NPO prior to the surgery. However, in the morning, they may take their antihypertensive medications. They may take maybe their seizure medications. 
Uh, we are going to hold their diabetic medications though. The surgeon usually allows this with a very small sip of water in the morning. Looking at the post-operative care, we're going to do several things. The first one being the use of the incentive spirometer. This is where they're going to inhale slowly, rising this little bellow, and we're going to do that 10 times an hour, and this is going to prevent post-operative pneumonia. One of the other things we may do is a blood transfusion. We may even infuse their own cells. They call this a cell saver. In fact, if you can look at this little device up top, it's called a hemovac. Yes, this is a drain. However, during the procedure, one of its jobs is to collect the blood that's draining from the wound and it goes through a machine. And this other little part right here, when the patient is in surgery, <clears throat> it actually has a tube that goes out and the drainage comes in it, and it comes out right here through the machine and into the patient's vein. So it's a way to conserve blood as well. They call that a cell saver. But when the patient leaves surgery, oftentimes they will have the cell saver connected to them for a couple hours and then the nurse on the floor will disconnect it. Like they'll cap that off, they'll cap that off and then whatever drainage that comes in here gets discarded. So a nurse is gonna manage the transfusion process. Next one right here is the surgical drains, which I sort of just kind of monitored or kind of mentioned. We're gonna empty those every eight hours and possibly sooner if needed. It is important to establish with your physician what is an expected drainage volume. So if you have 300 milliliters, for eight hours, that's actually deemed excessive. We want to report that rather than just say, well, let's just dump it and keep monitoring. So do establish with your physician how much is too much. Typical is like 100, maybe 150 every eight hours, FYI. Okay, uh, the nurse is going to assess the drainage uh, that comes on the dressing. We're gonna make sure that they have good pain control. I have some examples of pain control on the next slide. We're going to uh, assist them with all transfers and all mobility efforts. They are not allowed to walk around by themselves and do make sure that we use gate belts, which is a little strap that you're gonna put either around their waist or you put it around their chest. It just kind of depends on the person's body habitus. Know their activity limits. Some patients are non-weight bearing, some are toe touch weight bearing, others are weight bearing as tolerated. This is critical to know so we don't accidentally make a patient apply more weight than what is ordered and ruin the joint. Ooh, not good. Anytime I would like to transfer the patient out of bed, I'm gonna transfer them from the unaffected side. I'm gonna to go to the good hip. So if I've had a right leg total hip, I'm gonna ask them to get out of the left side of the bed rather than the other way around. So make sure to remember to transfer the patient from the unaffected side, the good side. When we're using the assistive walker or uh, when we're using the, yeah, when we're using the assistive walker, make sure that they are sitting down they have their balance they're not feeling woozy once they're stable you usually have one hand on the walker handle and then one arm is on the bed pushing themselves up never have both hands on the walker at the same time to rise they're going to pull the walker on themselves when it comes when it comes to sitting down the person with a walker wants to go ahead and square themselves up with the chair, with the bedside commode, whatever they're sitting down to, and they're not allowed to sit until they feel both of their legs touch the back of the, uh, the chair or whatever may be that they're sitting down to. Some of them like to sort of fall into the chair. That is a big no. So make sure they have turned, they have pivoted, they're square with the chair, and they are gonna reach both hands back and slowly try to reach the, the arms that are on the chair 
or the bedside commode, and then they're going to lower themselves down. If they have a knee, a lot of times I have them kick their leg forward to where they're resting on their heel rather than trying to bear a lot of that weight on the surgical leg. Same goes for the hip. Have them point, point their toes forward, uh, kind of like a ballerina would, so they are not using that leg to ease themselves down. When it comes to adaptive devices, make sure that they have a raised toilet seat. It is very difficult to go down to a toilet seat that is uh, very low because getting down is not the problem. It's usually getting up. And you'll be very happy if you have a raised toilet seat that has armrest on it. When it comes to um, the edema that's going to occur postoperatively, we want to make sure to apply ice to the surgical site. You're going to follow the sequence of 20 minutes on and 10 minutes off. The devices are oftentimes called a Kodiak or an Iceman. These are just brand names that you may want to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with if they say, hey, can you put some ice in the Iceman <laughs> or the ice in the Kodiak? <clears throat> Do know that this device here usually has um, been covered in a pillowcase, so you're not putting it directly over the skin. Uh, and always ice after some ambulation. It's going to uh, cause a lot of edema when they ambulate, and the ice is to help with the edema and the pain. On the next slide, we're going to talk about total hip precautions, so I'm going to leave that for the next slide, but let me talk a little bit more <clears throat> about the client's position. While the patient is in bed, make sure their head is slightly elevated and the leg remains in a neutral position. This is something you may have to check frequently and lift their covers up because they do wiggle in bed when we're not around. We should always have a pillow between their legs and, uh, or, and or an abduction pillow or a wedge pillow between their legs, especially when we turn them on their side. And do note, when we turn a patient who has had a hip, make sure they are rolling over on their uh, good hip, not their operative, operative side. So roll them on the good side. If you do happen to um, assess that the patient dislocated their hip, they're going to report an on, uh, acute onset of pain. You are going to hear a pop sensation or you're going to hear a pop sound it's very loud very audible and it's not unmistakable <clears throat> and then you're going to see an internal rotation of the infected extremity it's even going to have a difference in length so get your uh, get your co-worker to assess this with you to make sure you're not seeing something because when you report this the physician is going to move into action promptly And what I mean is your physician is going to make some pretty quick calls and you want to make sure that your assessment was accurate of your patient. Okay, so let's talk about the hip do's and don'ts. So after a hip arthroplasty, we're going to always use a chair that has arms and is slightly elevated. The reason being is we need this to be able to get up and down. Make sure that the patient's toes are always pointing straight up and down, or maybe rotating out just a little bit. They're externally rotated. What we don't want is for the patient to bend down greater than 90 degrees, meaning if they are sitting in a high back chair, we don't want them to lean down and fix something on their foot. That is definitely greater than 90 degree flexion at the hip. We want to make sure that the patient does not cross their ankles at any point in time or even cross their knees, hence why we keep the abduction pillow. And if a patient is in an altered mental status, you know, state, then we're actually going to take that pillow and strap it to their legs. We don't want them to forget. Do remind your patient not to internally rotate their toes. That really promotes the hip to pop out a socket. So they always need to keep their toes neutral or externally rotated.
let's go ahead and talk about some do's and don'ts for the knee total arthroplasties. First of all, dislocation is not actually common following a total knee arthroplasty, but it still can happen. So here's what's important to know. These right here, kneeling and deep knee bends are not good to do. They are actually limited indefinitely. I know that this is a very comfortable position for a patient to have their knee elevated on a bed or elevated on a pillow. However, this crazy joint will develop a contracture and unbeknownst to the patient, they will never be able to straighten their leg out if they continue to put a pillow behind their knee. So pillows must not be there. They are only to be under the ankle and the calf, which is going to straighten this leg a bit more and patients are not going to be happy and they're going to report that it is uncomfortable. However, it is acceptable to have a little bit of discomfort as the result of the extension of the knee joint. They say that um, a CPM machine, a continuous passive range of motion machine, is excellent for preventing contractures and allowing for quick, and quick, he quick healing. <laughs> it's gonna allow for quick healing and it's gonna reduce swelling. What it's gonna do is patients will have you know, of course, the assistance of a nurse to load their knee in this device. And very slowly, this machine is going to go up and down in a uh, elliptical type motion like a patient is walking. So lots of benefits to the CPM machine. Some don'ts about this one, or maybe I should say some do's. Do make sure that your patient has been properly medicated prior to putting their leg into this because they're going to sit in this machine for four hours with their legs slowly being rotated. And once the pain um, medication is in, they can tolerate the four hours well. Do make sure that we remove their leg with meals because they will have their meal tray in front of them and that's not fun to bump into while you're trying to eat. One last piece of information. The doctor is actually the one who prescribes the amount of flexion that he wants the knee to be positioned to. So that is something that's usually communicated in report and the nurse has to check the machine settings to make sure it is being followed. After a total hip or a total knee, nurses need to be very vigilant about some of the common post-operative complications. One of them is going to be DVTs or deep vein thrombosis. They may result in a pulmonary embolism. That's that blank here. That's a may result in a pulmonary embolism, which is a life-threatening complication following a total hip arthroplasty. So what is the nurse going to do? We're going to first and always monitor the client for symptoms of the PE. That includes acute dyspnea, tachycardia, and pleuritic chest pain, meaning pain upon inspiration, deep inspiration, I should say. We're going to make sure to follow the deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis protocol. That usually includes some pharmacological management, such as um, Lovenox or anoxaparin injections, heparin injections, and then some non-pharmacologic approaches. That's going to include anti-embolism stockings, sometimes we call those TEDHOS, and wearing SCDs while they are in bed. SCDs stand for sequential compression devices. We're going to make sure our patient ambulates as early as possible. Excuse me. <clears throat> that usually includes uh, walking with us or with physical or occupational therapy. Uh, we may also include another blood thinner for our patient. The name for this one is Eliquis or I can never say this one. We're going to go with Eliquis for now since I can't spit it out. Mm -hmm. All right, side note, clients who are obese and those with a history of DVTs are a 
at a greater risk for developing DVT thrombosis or PEs. So it is your job to know who is at greatest risk and to really enforce all of these preventative measures so we don't have the complication of DVT. And what does DVT look like? The, red, the leg, one particular leg, is going to be red, it's going to be hot, and it's going to be swollen and extremely painful to touch and to move. If we were to measure it, which I actually love that this nurse did this, you would actually see that the circumference is different. Four other complications to watch for. The hip dislocation we sort of talked about earlier, you know, hearing the pop, looking for the rotation, or maybe even the uneven length of the legs. But the two others, we're going to talk about infection, anemia, and neurovascular compromise. So we're going to be definitely checking the CBC um, probably every single day, and you're going to be monitoring the site for all of those signs and symptoms of infection. Is it red? Is it swollen or edematous? Is there a purulent drainage? <clears throat> uh, does our patient have a fever? And is it tender to touch? As you can see right here, this is evidence of infection. This isn't just healing pink red. This is definitely a problem right there. We're going to be assessing for any kind of anemia. This is going to be um, paired with looking at our drain output, <clears throat> the consistency and color of our drain output. We're going to be looking at the drainage itself, meaning look at the dressing right there. Always assess your dressing site. And as you notice here on the patient, do note the ecchymosis and if the patient has new ecchymotic areas or if they are in the various stages of healing. This one is maroon, so this one is a few days old. I would be interested in new um, ecchymotic areas, which are usually like a very dark bluish color, maybe even green <clears throat> that's bleeding under the skin. And just a note, when somebody has a hip or a knee, you're not going to see the bleeding on top. Always roll the patient over and look what their bottom has to, for you. Little surprises under there because that's where the blood is going to drain and pool. P-O-O-L. Pool. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, to continue on about the dropping hemoglobin hematocrit, we're going to see it kind of steadily drop 24 to 48 hours after surgery. However, even though it goes down a little bit, we're still going to be looking for those vital sign changes. We're going to be looking for hypovolemia. We're going to see tachycardia and hypotension. This usually flags us in addition to their CBC that this patient may need a transfusion because they're becoming symptomatic with their anemia. Okay, in terms of neurovascular compromise, we're going to continuously check the neurovascular status of the surgical extremity every two to four hours. Yep, that's a lot. We're checking for movement, sensation, color, pulse, cap refill, and we're always going to compare it to the contralateral extremity. So if they have a pulse on the right that's weak, they should have a pulse on the left that's weak. It shouldn't be uh, substantially different. We're going to monitor the compression bandage and the wound suction for excessive drainage. I kind of already mentioned that, didn't I? I did, didn't I? Okay. And in case you're curious, how low is low? When we do blood transfusions, they're usually eight or nine, or we'll transfuse you if you're 10 and symptomatic, but usually that's how low. Normal for females, do you remember that number? Hmm, I do wonder, what is a normal hemoglobin for a female? What is normal for a male? Wouldn't you like to know? Go check it out, go look it up. Okay, I absolutely cannot help myself. I feel like I have to tell you the answer to my previous question. The normal hemoglobin for a male is about 14 to 18. The normal hemoglobin for a female is 12 to 16. 
So if a person's symptomatic, usually at 10, we might transfuse you, but we normally don't until you're like eight or even nine on your hemoglobin. Okay, well, now you know. Let's talk about medications that we're gonna give our patient. Some of the medications that you can be guaranteed to give are the analgesics. We're talking the opioids, the narcotics. Do make sure that their blood pressure is high enough prior to giving it, as well as their um, respirations. They should be adequate. So after you've assessed those two things, your patient should get an opioid. Do make sure that they get a stool softener. There is nothing worse than making sure your pain is fixed, but now you're constipated. That's uh, going the wrong direction. We can give our patient uh, a PCA pump, which is what you see in this upper right. We're going to insert the syringe that comes from pharmacy, and the patient has a button, <clears throat> and they're allowed to give themselves a small little dose of medication, usually every six minutes or every eight minutes. The big don't on this one is to uh, ask the patient family members to hit the button. Only the patient is allowed to hit the button. Is the nurse allowed to hit the button for the patient? No. Well, what if the patient's not cognizant enough to hit the button? Maybe they have a baseline altered mental status. Well, then they do not need the pump. We need to abort that protocol and allow the nurse to use their judgment to assess the patient's pain and administer pain medication. We can give um, oral, um, oral medications such as Lortab. Um, <clears throat> usually they don't do both oral and IV narcotics. Oftentimes it's usually one or the other, or sometimes the nurses may alterate, alternate. Excuse me. We are going to make sure our patients get antibiotics, usually prophylactically, like just before they roll into surgery. And then following surgery, we're going to give it eight hours after their first dose, usually two to three doses after. So it is really important if you're the nurse recovering that patient that you figure out when did you get your first dose because I have the next one to follow eight hours afterward. And then that helps the next nurse know when their antibiotic is due eight hours after that one. That's really important to know. All right, when it comes to anticoagulation, uh, here I have some examples of the ones that you are going to be giving. Do note that we need to make sure their platelets are sufficient enough prior to giving our medications. And if we are giving that heparin right there, we're gonna check their bleeding time, their PTT. Anybody wanna take a shot at what is the antidote to heparin? Hmm? Any guesses? Your answer is protamine sulfate. That is a classic, classic NCLEX style question. Antidote to heparin, protamine sulfate. Always. <clears throat> okay. I had, uh, I would like to introduce you the on cue pump or the peripheral nerve block. This is so neat. The nurse, or excuse me, the physician will insert this teeny, it's a teeny little tube. This is just the IV tubing there, but there's a smaller tube attached to that that's going to be threaded into the patient's muscle group and it's going to bathe the nerves with bupivacaine. And that is, uh, or even an, um, another anesthetic type drugs, they have a couple of them. But this is going to allow the pain uh, nerve receptors to not communicate to the brain and the patient's gonna have much better recovery and able to tolerate their post-operative um, duties much better, as such as walking and deep breathing, all that good stuff. Uh, what is important to know about the on cue pump is that the dressing should always be dry, meaning if it is infusing into the skin, we're not gonna see any kind of drainage or leakage on top. However, if there is a tear in the catheter's integrity, those things are very th thin, very fragile, then we're actually gonna see some moisture develop under the patient's uh, dressing, as well as maybe even like a little pool. If that's the case, please call anesthesia because there should not be any kind of drainage under there. It should not be wet or moist. That's a problem to report. Last thing to know about the continuous peripheral nerve blocks or the on-cue pumps 
is that occasionally it's kind of rare, but we may even have a catheter tip migrate into the bloodstream and it will be then delivering the medication into the person's vascular system. And if that's the case, you're going to see hypotension with bradycardia and even seizures. Please call the doctor. All right. I take a bow and I say thank you so much for listening. I appreciate your attention and I hope you learned something a little bit more today about arthroplasties.